Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to um, It's Bloody Complicated, the Compass podcast. I'm the host, Neil Lawson. Um, these are unprecedented times, and we need to rise to new and enormous challenges we now face. Over the next few weeks, I'll be speaking with writers, thinkers, politicians, journalists, and doctors about how we come out of this in much better shape than we went into it, a good society after the COVID crisis. These conversations have live access for Compass members who can put their questions directly to our guests. If you'd like to participate in a live call, go to compassonline.org.uk forward slash podcast to join Compass now. Otherwise, sit back, relax and enjoy episode two. If this crisis changes everything, then it, must, then it must start by changing how we think, behave and interact. A crisis that tears us apart is also pulling us together in new and challenging ways. It's an undoubtedly a moment for a new era of collectivism, but the form of that collectivism will be contested. It might be authoritarian and elitist, or it can be democratic and, and egalitarian. Everything depends on us and how we respond. For, them, for some, though, the crisis seems it's, it's proved them right and has changed them very little. They seem to say the same things only with greater sense of certainty. But surely the first priority now is to ask questions of ourselves. What did we get wrong? Why did we get into this mess? And what are we now learning? And what do we do differently to get out of it better? We crave certainty, strong leadership and answers, if they, as if they can just be handed down from above. But the crisis reveals not just the obvious and pressing problems of inequality, but the emotion and cultural crisis of an age where certainty in the centre are reaching their limits. What is being revealed is a new age of complexity in which we need to be able to say, we don't know and express our vulnerability. So how do we navigate both the crisis and negotiate and prepare ourselves for what comes after? To discuss this, the emotions and ethics of the crisis and more, we are joined tonight by Julia Unwin, who has written extensively on kindness and chaired the Future of Civil Society project, Jennifer Nadal, who is the co-director of Compassion in Politics, and David Robinson, who directs the Relationships Project. The format that we will follow is I'll ask a few questions and then open it up to Compass members who are on the call for questions and comments before I conclude with a final round of points from the panel. Now, please keep any questions or comments as brief as possible so that we can get in as many people as possible. And as Zoom etiquette demands, and, I'm now, and I know we're now all learning, please keep yourself on mute unless otherwise invited to speak and post your questions on the chat box, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen to the right of the mute button. And finally, please note, as I said, this conversation is being recorded to go out as a podcast. Now, Julia, let's start with you. From your thinking and writing about kindness, what's your instinct about how we'd react to the emotional, to the emotional crisis um, and the challenges that it's now posing? Well, I've written quite a lot about how our public policy environment um, has for decades really downgraded emotions and replaced our feelings and our sense of love for each other with a set of metrics and KPIs and other ways of talking. Done it for good reason, but it hasn't served us well because public policy, public services are, in my view, always about relationship. I think that's been put into stark relief by this horrendous crisis where I think everybody is feeling absolute terror. They are feeling the grief of those who've lost people they have loved, people who have died, but the grief for opportunities lost and the fear about what will come next. And they've combined that quite rightly with a righteous anger about how badly this has been handled. What I worry about is the way in which we talk about it in public is not acknowledging all of that. I therefore think we're not communicating well and this is a crisis that above all else needs good communication. But I fear we're also not taking people with us because people saying what they've all had in response to a crisis are not listening to the lived experience of people who are feeling deeply hurt by what's happening. So, so do you feel that this is a, you know, so our, our kind of a public and political discourse, the nature of it, 
um, is just completely inappropriate. And we'll get onto this with Jennifer. It, it just feels you know, incapable of adapting to the demands of the moment. It feels incapable of noticing what's going on. I did hear the Deputy Chief Medical Officer today for the first time say that staff in the NHS are frightened at the five o'clock briefing. That's the first time I've heard somebody senior acknowledge the levels of terror that people are feeling. Now, I don't want to overindulge this. There's no point in just talking about the emotions, but unless you recognise them, you're always doomed to make mistakes. And what I've feared is that this crisis, which is shown so graphically the gross inequality in our country can get a rather cheap political response that treats it simply as an opportunity simply as a hurdle to be got through simply as a technocratic response when in fact it's much more fundamental than that and we know that social change only happens when people are genuinely engaged not when they're just spoken to in a technocratic language which doesn't reflect their real lived experience so what does that what does that tell us then about you know what can we do begin to do differently um you know if if our democratic and political discourse is is you know hierarchical paternalistic um uh, technocratic i mean you know what, what do people like us on this call around compass and others begin to do and behave differently in order to begin to shape because though i don't know if it is I guess what I'm asking, Julia, is, mm. is the whole world capable of changing or, or you know, in your work, particularly around the civil society project, you know, how do we begin to use this as a moment to, to transform the way in which we relate to each other and the way in which we talk to each other? Well, this last 10 days, and we have to be really careful about what lessons we draw from it, but what we have seen is explosion of people's care for their neighbours and the people who are closest to them extraordinary things have been done in ways that I don't think any of us could have predicted. Organisations have moved mountains to get ready for this horror. So I'm not saying that people can't do it, but that if when that those institutions and organisations are not listening really, really carefully to what people are saying, they may be missing the point. We are in the biggest experiment of behaviour change I think we've ever seen, certainly in my lifetime. And unless we do that with paying really acute attention to what people are saying and how they're feeling and listening really carefully, we will fail as in, in terms of the response to the crisis, but we will also fail in terms of what we do afterwards. It is too soon, I think, to talk about this as an opportunity which yeah. will allow us to do everything we've always said, because we've got to get through this. We've got to bring people with us. But those of us thinking ahead, need to do, as I understand people talk about after other natural disasters, build differently, build better later. We can't do that unless we're listening to people's experience of what they've learned and what they've heard. And I think we're rather turned deaf to that at the moment. Okay, let's come back to that kindness stuff. Let's turn to Jennifer. Um, and uh, Jennifer, you know, politics in the UK is pretty horrible. I mean, not least because it's so adversarial. Um, you know, it's the kind of politics which I only win if you lose. Um, now, your work at Compassion in Politics, you know, what does that tell us about the culture of our political system and what we have to do and can do differently? Well, essentially, our work is about trying to find the common ground and trying to find the things that unite us and find ways of bridging party hostility, party gaps. And we, do, and we particularly work on issues relating to compassion because compassion isn't just something that is... Uh, that the property of the left there are those on the right as well who want to come together so we really see compassion as as um, a quality that has the possibility of becoming a unifying principle and of course what this crisis has done is it has removed some of the adversarial components to the way we're doing politics it has brought unity in a way that isn't normally there when there is no crisis and you know it is extraordinary what suddenly becomes possible in the midst of a crisis and, and I hear what Julia said absolutely about this being a time to listen and to get through the crisis but what we know from China from you know the way the virus has worked there is that we have a window of maybe three to six months we have this hiatus in normal life and this isn't to diminish that lived experience and, and the terror that Julia, you rightly alluded to, but it is to say that those of us who are working politically and trying to shape 
what kind of world comes after the virus really have a very limited time, a very limited time, you know, whether it's climate crisis that we want to focus on and the fact, you know, that one of the great ironies of this crisis is that all those things we were told could never happen and that society was never ready for are miraculously happening. And we're really at a crossroads because we cannot go back to business as usual. You know, and if we look at the main crises that we've had preceding this, if we look at, um, 9-11 and then we look again at 2008 we had these seismic shifts and they both were followed by actions that made things worse in our world rather than better so while the crisis while we are in that window we really need to be having conversations about wouldn't this be a great moment to begin dealing with climate change and and as you say listening to what people say but also trying to make sure something positive does come out of this. What's your experience so far, Jennifer, of politicians and any kind of change in their behaviour? Is there, are there any examples or in terms of the people you're talking to, are they behaving differently? Well, I was talking to a senior Tory, former, former front bencher, who I share very few political um, goals with, but she, she felt depoliticised when I was talking to her. She said, you know, it's pointless telling people to stay at home if you haven't got any way of getting food to them. That wasn't very well thought out. She was only really concerned about the well-being of her constituents, those who couldn't get food, those who couldn't afford food, those who were trapped in their homes. And her energy was being spent on trying to improve how her constituents were living. And, and it just really made me think, you know, that's another silver lining to the crisis is that the things that matter most are now uppermost on people's minds you know we managed to forget about mortality we managed to forget about the big existential questions but now you know in a nanosecond we're suddenly all confronted with the possibility of death which of course we're living with all the time but normally we manage to disguise that through activity and distraction and drama and all sorts of things but now we are really smack faced with our mortality and how we as humans want to live and what our values really are so what what are the kind of things that you would suggest you know need to happen around the culture or structures of our politics that we need to change because i mean it's the one area that that has isn't having much conversation people are talking about the economy what we do about the economy and they're talking about you know there's some conversation about the environment but very little about our democracy and the nature of our decision making and how we relate and talk to each other so what you know, what would the, what are the things you want to see happen to, to to ensure that we don't just spring back to how things were in terms of our politics well i'll take that in two halves if i may First of all, there is so much that needs changing with the way we do politics, which is archaic, which enshrines bullying at the heart of the political process, a whipping system where parliamentarians are discouraged and in fact bribed into not saying what they truly believe. You know, we have that horrendous situation running up into to Christmas where those who oppose Brexit, some of them were too physically scared to express the truth of their point of view. And that is a dire, dire thing for a democracy. And, you know, we like to think of ourselves as the mother of all democracies. Well, what I can tell you is that a lot of our children are far more functional than we are. You know, we have Wales, we have Scotland, where, you know, we do have forms of proportional representation and, and parliaments that are in a circle or almost a circle. So, so yes, we need to get rid of first past the post. We need to change the architecture of the building. We need to change what is and isn't seen as permissible in the debates. But although that's really important for me, I, I want to be having the conversations that go to where people are now. Um, so that can all feel really theoretical. And those are conversations that we need to have. But I don't think that's the conversation that the public want to have. And the two conversations that I'm most concerned about right now is how can we really make it clear that this is a dry run for the climate crisis? You know, what's happening now is nothing compared with the climate crisis. And that is saying a lot. And secondly, you know, how the money that is going to be spent to keep our economy afloat, how can we make sure that that is spent in ways that build a fairer society? You know, how can we make sure the money doesn't go into carbon intensive industries, bailing out 
the airlines instead of investing in things that will enable us to have a truly green economy so it's what's going to happen if we have quantitative easing and money being poured into our economy where's it going to go can we not have that horrific waste of an opportunity that we had in 2008 and secondly this is a moment when we can really start to make the climate crisis real this is a crisis that's right smack up in our faces the climate crisis is always seen as more remote but let's try and really make sure that that we're talking about the two side by side okay brilliant thanks jennifer um i'll come over to david next but if people on the call um could start posting their questions and points in the chat box um that would be fantastic you can type out your question or you can just net, net, as you're beginning to know put h in the uh in the chat box and, and we'll come to you and let you ask your question so if people could start doing that um that would be fantastic thank you so over to you david who and you've been running this um, relationships project for a little while now so what's that telling you about the kind of the way we can should be working together um, now in the crisis, but as we come out of it in different kinds of ways? Uh, well, a couple of things, Neil. I, I, think, I think we are recalibrating how we think about uh, risk and trust. I, I, I've got neighbours who are not only shopping, but also lending money to one another. And there's, there's no volunteer handbook on all this. This is just human beings being human. A really interesting question, I think, is, is whether uh, after this period we rediscover stranger danger and, and uh, risk aversion, or whether we recalibrate for good. And I think part of the answer for that lies in how we are telling the stories and how we hear the stories now. I think we hear stories differently. Uh, I hear, as, as Julia does, uh, more than a quarter of a million community groups, 300 and uh, three quarters of a million NHS volunteers, and I think we are a better society than we sometimes say that we are. But others, of course, hear about people hoarding food, ignoring distancing guidelines and so on. And, and we know that crises uh, more often reinforce our beliefs than they challenge them. So perhaps it's, it's not very surprising that at the end of the first week, we were almost equally divided on our opinions about the state of our society. You were reporting that 51% of us feel more less positive about the state of our society now than we did before the crisis began. We hear these stories very, very differently. And because we hear them differently, we retell them and we use different words that are different. And I think that really, really matters uh, now because how we talk now will determine uh, how we emerge from the crisis. Remember, uh, you know, Labour's deficit, Labour's financial crisis, that language established a storyline for austerity and expenditure cuts. We've really got to get the language right now and the stories that we tell now to lay the ground for the future that we want. Uh, I'll post on, on, the chat, on the chat box the uh, a link to the work that Iona Lawrence is leading now on a uh, connection coalition, which is going to be trying to amplify some of the really positive stories uh, and, and get the language right on this stuff. And, and and David, um, what what can people do? Is this a job for politicians? Is it a job for organisations? Is it a job for us as individuals? You know, and, and how do they begin to work together to create a paradigm shift in the way that we relate to each other and um, and negotiate this kind of different future? Well, I see. I think we're already seeing it, Neil, in the small stuff on the ground. I think the challenge is how do we embed that and continue it into the future? And we have had moments in the past, none perhaps as momentous as this, but we certainly have moments have had moments in the past when uh, uh, people like me perhaps were saying things won't be the same again, and then it turned out they were the same again. So I think we've got to we've got to think about how we embed them for the future. And uh, in seeking out the positives now, we, we mustn't sugarcoat the scale of what we're facing. Um, we are not, as I think some people are suggesting, halfway up the hump of a crisis which is going to have a long tail. It seems to me we are uh, halfway up the first hump of a three-hump crisis. Uh, most economists anticipate a following recession at least, at least as deep as 2008. And that economic crisis we know uh, will be followed by a social crisis because they always are. And the last recession and the policies which flowed from it were responsible for 130,000 preventable deaths. So these are the really big humps ahead. And so we've got to not only uh, care for one another now, 
but also try to absorb and embed the positives in the scenarios of the future, in scenarios that are really honest and real. And that's what uh, the Relationships Project is concentrating on now in, in a collaborative observatory. I'll also post a link for that in a moment. Okay, thank you, David. So look, we've got a kind of landscape there to, to consider, um, which is a, a big space. And I, and I don't think we're seeing that kind of conversation happen um, in, the, in the wider media. So that's why it's great to have this going. So let's get, go over to some of the people, um, members who have been asking uh, questions. If I can get back and try and uh, find them. There was firstly, and we'll take a few of these um uh, uh and and come back to the panel uh, as and when um samar you asked a question about climate crisis do you want to just kind of give that to the panel the call has been very interesting um yes i mean the, the um i think so is it Je jennifer you were talking about the um, how it's really important that we link this to uh, to the climate crisis but my question is well people don't see this in the same way as they see the climate crisis the climate crisis seems slower it, the sort of the danger for us seems less direct how can we how can we make that how can we bridge that gap well okay. I think that that has been the problem but actually a lot of the language that that climate change campaigners have been using is now becoming every day for us you know thousands and thousands of people dying you know flattenings of curve trying to pace ourselves so that we avoid you know a huge upswing of crisis at any one moment so I think that some of the work is being done for us because we are dealing daily with the language of crisis and with the language of mortality and the fragility of life but there's obviously still a long long way to go but I think that that some of the language will make it slightly easier for us to make that connection Okay, and, and Ruth, do you want to ask your question? Ruth Lister? Oh, sorry, I'm just unmuting. Right, okay. Yeah, um, I, mean, I was very struck, uh, particularly what Julia said about listening and hearing what people are saying, their emotions. <clears throat> That's hard enough to do at the best of times. Um, I mean, you and I, Julia, share a real concern about the marginalisation of the voices of people in poverty and so forth. But how, in this situation, do we, how do we hear, how do we listen? Because the, the, the present, the, our only way of doing so is through the media who are filtering these things and not kind of giving that, that clear, mes clear messages as to what people are feeling. They're not going to come to compass most people. So how do we do it? And how do we do it in a way, and this links, I think, to someone else's question, you know, in, in a way which is inclusive and we make sure it's the, the people who are really suffering because, you know, people who are um, you know, material, their material insecurity is now kind of going through the roof. And uh, I mean, I, it's bad enough for people, those of us who are secure, what it must be like for those who are insecure and don't know what is going to happen to them in terms of their, their, where they live, their money and so forth. Never mind the existential terror that people are feeling. Okay, I mean, I mean perhaps if uh, Julia can come back and that was, a, that was echoes a, a, a question from Trude, which was kind of, you know, um, what does listening look like in practice and how do we you know, hear you know, diverse experiences of people who are living in po poverty, etc. Um, so, yeah, Julia. Okay. Well, I don't have a magic answer because I don't think it's straightforward at all. But I do know that at a time of enormous outpouring of solidarity and people working their socks off to protect their neighbours and to work closely with whoever's around them, this is a moment when people are talking far more than they ever did. And I've I haven't done any research on this, I just listen in. People, they don't use the word language of climate change. They do use the language of, we've brought some of this on ourselves, we've done some things wrong. I heard somebody say quite recently, it's perhaps better that we're just doing everything locally now. It's not any more connected, you know, it was an anti-globalization point, but the way they were framing it was a nostalgia for a past, yep, but also a sense that local is better, that small is better, that neighborhoods can do stuff. There's a very different language going on in the community groups and those parts of civil society which are deeply rooted in the poorest places. Now, I don't mean by this that you're interviewing people when you're giving them 
food in a food bank that would be grotesque but it is something to do with tuning in and yes Ruth I'm with you they won't come to campus nor should they they won't come directly but there are people working there and I think we have to hear what they want to say to us not what we want them to be thinking because I think the biggest risk we face emotionally is something we've known about certainly since 2008 is the extraordinary collapse of trust at a time when we need trust we people are not trusting their politicians they're not trusting their leaders um, with a few exceptions they're trusting some experts i suspect so it's how we hear the voices of people who are listening very acutely i think um, and recognize that we are such a deeply divided society that the ways in which this awful crisis is experienced is completely different um, there was a minister on today talking about this morning about you should only shop once a week, which was sort of a preposterous way of talking to anybody who hasn't got a fridge freezer and preferably a car. It was just spoke volumes about the distance we've got to travel. David, do you want to come back on, on that point about, you know, how, how we listen and who we listen to? Well, I, I think that is a job for civil society to ensure that those voices are amplified. Um, I think that is exactly what we are there to do and, and there is a danger uh, that at the moment we are overtaken by the need to respond to the urgent but we overlook the important and if we are to in, uh, uh, absorb and embed some of the lessons from this crisis we need to make sure that every voice is heard. I think that's a, a, a job for civil society and although I absolutely agree with, with Julia that we are uh, trusting politicians has, has fallen away and equally of course trusting in charities has, has dropped as well but we are now through this crisis trusting one another and ensuring that we listen to one another and ensuring that we use the structures that we've got to amplify those voices I think is a critical role for civil society. Um. David Edgar, do you want to come in and ask your question, please? Go on. Um, all, all I was saying, really, was, was thinking about, about big moral questions. And, the, and there was one which emerged, uh, you know, in the weekend of the great change, which was between herd immunity on, on the one hand and, and isolation on the other. Uh, and, and, and the way in which, uh, you know, summarised colloquially in the, in the ghastly phrase, let them die. Um, and, and the idea that because old people were much more vulnerable and young people were going to get through it, it was just like the flu, uh, and they'd build up a herd community and that the sacrifice was worth making. And it seemed that that debate wasn't conducted, you know, in, 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 in to put it mildly, uh, in, in, in the full, you know, the full awfulness of, 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 of the proposal. But I think it did raise interesting questions generation about the fact that you know, there clearly is a potential generational conflict that thus far has been avoided, actually, partly because of that change of policy. And I think that's a really good thing. Okay. I mean, I think let's, let's take that as a point rather than a necessary as a question, but one of the... Yes, yeah, sorry. It wasn't yeah, no, it's fine. It's good. I mean, you don't have, people don't have to just ask questions. They can make points. And I think, you know, the fear of the intergenerational stuff hasn't been exposed yet, but it might be. And we need to be wary, wary of it. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, it's Ed here, Ed Mayo, and uh, very good to see the panellists uh, all healthy and well, and thanks so much for the contributions. Um, the question particularly for uh, Julia and David, perhaps just, you know, given, given your track record, um, I've, I've been uh, struck by how much of an afterthought, really, uh, sadly, civil society has been in policy terms, um, even if in reality, social cooperation is exactly at the heart of the, the public response that policymakers uh, want to see. And I just wonder, what, you know, what do we, those of us in the sector, what do we learn and um, what can we then do to change that? Julia? I think, really, I think that's a really good point, but I don't think it's this time. Do you think that if anything has proven the absolute dependence of the state locally and nationally on active civil society, it has been this. So in every town or city I know that response plans have completely engaged people in civil society. Some of those organisations in a week or two have finances and this appalling 
grasp of that. They manage to pay for self-control, absolutely ignores. But there's no local health that doesn't engage actively and is shaped by local civil society. So I don't see it as coming late in terms of policy, unless policy means that which the Westminster government is doing, where clearly they have been laggards, and I think are letting down the entire country by failing to deal with the fact that civil society is both articulating the voice in the way that David said, in contact with some of the people who are suffering most deeply during this crisis, and bringing the solutions at the same time. In a sense, it's a textbook case of why civil society exists. Okay, we're losing Julia slightly. I can think of there's been that level of. Julia, we've lost you slightly. Oh, sorry. Oh, I don't think I moved. Forgive me. No, David, do you want to come in? So, so. Uh, I, I, I... Come on, Julia, sorry. Is that better? No. Um, just, just check how well connected you are, Julia, because you were coming in and out there. David, over to you. I, I agree, Ed. I think there was an extraordinary timidity about uh, government's request for a quarter of a million volunteers, or the NHS volunteers, which of course was the first request, and then I think they got that uh, in 20 odd hours, and, and within uh, two days it was up to 750,000. It could have been more. Uh, and I, I hope that that lesson has been learnt. There is a, 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 there is a great uh, a resource that is, is, is underplayed, I think, uh, all the time, not just in this crisis. Um, but I, I think, Julie, you were saying that uh, you kept breaking up. I think you were saying that you, 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 your uh, view was that at a moment uh, local authorities were much more inclined to be engaging with civil society than central government. Um, I, I, if that was what you were saying, I would say that my, uh, from where I sit, the, 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 uh, the experience seems to be much more patchy than that. I think some are engaging very well. Some, though, seem to be... Uh, if not uh, it, it actively cooperating, then um, uh, possibly even in, in some sort of antagonistic relationship. And, and it goes back to, to perhaps a point I made earlier, that the crises tend to reinforce our behaviour and the beliefs that we had before, rather than change them. Local authorities that didn't think civil society, and maybe a government that didn't think civil society was of much value, will continue to think that. But if we can't challenge that now, and in the midst of this crisis, and in the midst of uh, the great upset in, in, in community engagement that we've seen in recent days, so we really must seize the moment. Okay. Um, I don't know if did, did is Sophia has she rejoined the call, Grace or Jack? She has. She's been making some good points about. Um, no, I think she. I think she. Um, she's gone. She's not. She's not back. Okay, well, let's let's kind of. Um, uh, she said, I mean, I'll read it out. Um, this is Sophia Parker. Learning about uh, how care powers and the economy care of ill people, older people, kids, seems to be a huge story here. How can we amplify that story and use it to rebalance the dysfunctional emphasis, emphasis on paid work um, that is such a feature of life today? So this is that big question about, you know, you know who we rewarded and who we gave esteem to in the workplace compared to now who are the key workers and that is a fundamental shift because those people tend to be you know the, the you know the, the caring social end of of the workplace who we've dismissed um paid little attention to paid little money to um so it, you know again it's the same underlying question all the time which is how can we embed this stuff and 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 make permanent you know these shifts so has anyone got a comment um uh, uh jennifer on 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 that and and your feelings about that shift around what we now value and what we now emphasize i think very definitely because we can now disprove one of the most ugly tenets of neoliberalism which is that you know that people get their just desserts and their just rewards because we can all see that the value of a shop worker and the value of a nurse so heavily outweighs the value of a banker in a crisis so it's very very clear and just picking up a bit on the point that um, was being discussed before about civil society in the state you know we now know we now have an admission from a you know a very right-wing conservative government that the state can't do it alone that there is such a thing as society which of course we knew all along but it's being said and we also so so we have an admission that that the government can't do it without society. But we also have an admission that the state has a very real and essential function to play in our lives. So we can no longer talk 
in quite the sa same way about the value of the state as was being done prior to this crisis. And what I'm really, you know, feel positive about is that we're really seeing some very radical actions, you know, all the things that we're conditioned not to do in society, not to talk to strangers, not to go out in your pyjamas, all the social rules we are breaking. And I think that that is empowering, that there's something attractive about that. And I really hope that that energy can be hung on to because we now know what we can do as citizens okay so we've been we've been empowered you know with that stuff just as we've been disempowered in terms of you know where we can go and where we can travel and who we can connect with etc it's the kind of it's the ambivalence of the moment that gets me all of the time that on the one hand it's anxiety and fear on another level it's hope you know and 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 optimism that we can use this as a as a reset and how we judge the the kind of emotions and the sentiment of that you know it's the people who look and feel like they're kind of enjoying it right this proved that they were always right and now they're going to tell you that they were always right it's how do we steer away from that david do you want to come back on that kind of you know care and who we value side of it in terms of you know who we relate to well, I, th I think I think uh, it, that's a wonderful point that there were very few hedge fund managers on the key worker list, and, and it, it will it will fundamentally, I think, change our value system at least in the short term. Uh, but again, we know that you know old orthodoxies die hard, and and I think uh, my my fear would be that as after the uh, uh, the banking crisis of two thousand and eight, when we we talk about things never being the same again, after a while they become the same again, and we've really yeah. been alert to that to that possibility. Okay, and I'll just warn all of you that that will be the kind of concluding point that I'd like you to come back on in after a couple more uh, questions about what's your recipe, what's your, you know, in terms of the way we behave, what we do, how we restructure, um, what is it that stops us rebounding in that way? What would you like to see happen? So please be thinking about that time. In, in the meantime, Martin Yana, you had a kind of slightly more political question, but one I think that's important. Do you want to come in quickly, Martin? Hi, yes. Um, I'm just fascinated by the way in which suddenly what seem to be the narrower um, boundaries of what we thought of as the Progressive Alliance have been extended in all sorts of directions by this crisis. Um, you know, the way that, for example, in some employers have really been struggling really hard to keep hold of all the people they employ and looking after them. Um, the way, obviously, that people in the health and social care sector have been straining so hard. Um, the way that um, mutual aid groups have grown up in, not just in uh, working class and low and middle class areas, but traditional Tory suburbs. So should, shouldn't we be taking note of this and uh, changing our view of what the Progressive Alliance could be? Uh, seeing it as a much broader church than we had done before. Thank you, Martin. And that kind of makes that point that we've made a few times that, you know, if you go back to the 1940s, um, it, was the, it was the Conservative, Lord, Lord Helsham, then Quentin Hogg, who coined the term social security. And it's when you get people across a political spectrum um, in a new place, then a new consensus isn't just built, but is maintained and sustained. So what do people say? Jennifer, you're more on the front line of politics. You know, what do you feel about that? Well, I don't want to preempt your final question, but I think it's absolutely the case that 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 those on the right and those of the middle classes and Tory voting districts have had that same experience of the power of community. And how can we keep that going? And certainly in terms of the work that Compassion in Politics is doing, you know, we will be looking to band together politicians from across the spectrum that feel that, feel that way in the hope that we can somehow galvanise their energy to make policy changes. I'm also just noticing Francesca's point coming up, but maybe I'll let you, yeah, I'll let you okay. pass on to others. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe just you, Julia, if your sound's back on okay, and Absolutely. despite the fact we can't see you, which is sad, you know, I mean, you work across the political sphere. How do, you know, do you think this will, you know, it, it develop a different kind of dynamic? I think it shifts all sorts of boundaries. I think Martin's point is really interesting about how, how some businesses have behaved so differently from what we'd expected. 
some are doing really interesting things. Some, are, well, they say, revert back to paying dividends and behaving appallingly, but many have been shocked by this. And I think there is time for a completely new conversation across political boundaries. I'm with Jennifer on that. However, I think some of this is local and small scale and not national. And I think that's a real struggle for those of us who've tended to think politics is at the macro level, because of course, in the end, that's where it has to be. But we have to reconnect to what's happening locally. I think this crisis, and of course the coming climate crisis, which in the north of England has felt quite real for a bit because we've had our years of flooding, um, is actually changing things about how people feel about their place. I think that became a fashionable thing to say after the Brexit vote. But I think it's now absolutely material to new politics. Okay, thank you, Julia. Um, one more from, um, uh, from the chat box. Um, sorry we couldn't get everyone in. Um, but we'll keep the whole list of questions and, and look at how we can respond uh, to any that we've missed out. Francesca, do you want to come in with your point? Thanks, Neil. Um, I, I'll just I'll just repeat what I've written, really, that, that I the same issue that David raised, David Edgar, um, about the early utilitarian calculation of how many lives could legitimately be sacrificed in order to keep society moving and not go into the lockdown that we're in now, that whole theory of herd immunity in order to get us there. Uh, I thought, wow, um, this is a massive ethical issue and how are we going to deal with it as a society? And we were kind of saved by the bell at that point because there was a kind of, I think, instinctive backlash against it. But I'm not satisfied that that's over. It depends how long this goes on for. Uh, I think if the potential, if the public health crisis is prolonged, there's a potential for this tension to arise again, which is actually really between the so-called vulnerable people with, you know, disabilities, underlying health conditions and the fit. It's a survivor of the fittest issue, and they cut across generations, although obviously there's going to be more uh, people with underlying health conditions the older they get. Um, there was an article, I don't know if people saw it in the Observer, about someone with stage four cancer uh, being told that she, if she went down with the virus, she wouldn't be treated in hospital given the scarcity of resources. And uh, I've heard this from medics myself, and, and my ears are attuned to this being said. And I think there's a danger of this kind of huge ethical debate being lost and, and you know shielded by a sort of technocratic assumption so i think we do have a role and that's my question to the panelists how do we sort of draw out the ethical uh, assumptions behind such statements and decisions okay um david do you want to come in quickly on that one Uh, my only observation is the one I've made before and others have made too about uh, observing and teasing out the insights in real time. I think there is a danger that a kind of retrospective coherence will, uh, will reinterpret the journey if we wait for six months and look back on it. We need to be having these kinds of conversations as we have. If I can I just come in there very quickly. Yeah. I, I was on a call last week with with health experts in the States, one of whom was that the head of Harvard Medical School, and they were just talking so disparagingly about the British response, and they, they characterised it as just being leaving people to die, let's just see how many die, was the way they talked about it. But I think Francesca's point's really important, because what we're really talking about is health rationing. We're talking about not having enough economic resources to meet the health needs of all who need it, and who is going to make those decisions. Uh, are they just going to be done in a haphazard way? And as Francesca rightly says, does that mean those who are most vulnerable, the disabled, are in a sense going to have their mortality hastened because there isn't, hasn't been a real debate and a real owning of the fact that this is what that crisis could sadly and probably is already sadly meaning? So let's let's begin to wrap this up now. And, I'm, and again, I apologise for slightly the sound quality. Um, uh, but also the fact that we couldn't get every get everyone in, so um, kind of in reverse order. So, so Julia, what's your kind of wish list? Uh, what do you want to see that we do differently, that we get right, and how we behave differently, in order to try and you know um, uh, ensure that we don't just kind of bounce back, spring back, return to uh, business as normal. What do you want to see? I want us to be recording really precisely what's happening. I think we need an equivalent of mass observation so that we know what people are saying and what they're feeling and what they're 
their thinking. I think we need to discipline ourselves not to join in with making everything that's happened inform everything that we've always thought. And I think there are real challenges to that. I think the point about how business is behaving, how the right of century is behaving, the different behaviours in local authorities, which David and I were discussing, or David was pointing out to me, I think we need to recognise those differences, take us to different places. Um, and I think we need to find a way of ensuring that we build trust, at least in the scientists and experts around, even though we know how contested everything they are is saying. Yeah, so let, how do we bring them into the democratic conversation? Yeah. Jennifer? Yeah, I, I agree with Julia. I think we have to build on the evidence that we have, which is that people are in fact much more compassionate and much more civic minded than we've led to believe that we are. You know, and the truth is those of us who are old enough to remember life pre-1979 remember very well living in a society where it was taken for granted that we would all help each other if things were difficult and that has been systematically edged out of our political discourse and our political ideology and i think we do need to hang on to that evidence and something else as well which is that once people have experienced doing something very differently those businesses that have been driven by doing the right thing not maximizing profits you know it's it's a very it's a really nurturing and nourishing thing to know what it feels like to actually do something good and maybe just maybe we can try and build on that feeling so that people won't quickly trade it in for the quick kind of adrenaline hit of getting more or becoming faster and more adept and passing that winning line and elbowing others out of the way so my my hope is that the experience we've all had of joining together in our communities, whatever that may have looked like, will abide with us and we'll have a really fresh memory of what society could be like. Thank you, Jennifer. David? I think you know, we've got to keep in mind ourselves that this, this crisis won't be over soon. It will just take a new shape. And, and we've got to keep hanging on to the, the recollection that there will be a financial crisis and there will be a social crisis that follows on from that. So thinking about how we carry through the learning through wave after wave of buffeting, rather than assuming we're simply going to, you know, the pandemic will end and the new world will begin. We've got to keep reminding ourselves of that. I noticed in the chat box there was a concern about being unduly sort of optimistic about what we're learning and how we might hang on to that. And now I agree we mustn't be Pollyannaish about this. I do think that we are taking a great leap forward at the moment and we are not going to unknow our neighbours. We are not going to unwind the very hyper local WhatsApp groups that have been set up, the 270,000 community groups that have been set up. These aren't going to be lost. So I do think there's a great leap forward now and there's something to build on, but we will only be, be able to build on that if we, and in particular, the government, local and national, recognises the shift that has occurred and recognise that what we have learned or are learning in this crisis is that relationships aren't a fully extra. They are the makings of a stronger and more effective society. And really capturing those insights and embedding them as we go is absolutely fundamental. OK, thank you, David. I mean, I guess, you know, the lesson of all of this or part one of the lessons is, you know, I mean, it, it's awful that it takes a tragedy. Um, but how do we come out of that and, and, and use that experience? You know, a bit like how people use the tragedy of the war um, uh, and their memories of the Depression and their collectivist experience during the war in order to build a different kind of society. And if, if it could be done then, and, and that became pretty permanent, at least for three decades, um, you know, what can we do and what can we learn from that experience in the 21st century, which is a very different experience in a very different context, how can we begin uh, to ensure that um, we win, you know, the public health and, and safety, you know, side of this? It's not winning the peace, but it's winning the crisis and what comes after that. And I think you're right, David, that we are in for a succession of these things now. So thank you to David, to Julia, Jennifer, and for Phil while we could hear him, um, and all of you for being on the call and asking questions. Um, the support of Compass members is what makes these conversations possible. Um, so, uh, so if you're listening uh, uh, to the recording of this, please do sign up to us on the website at compassonline.org.uk forward cast podcast. 
Um, uh, and if you uh, enjoyed what you heard, please give us a rating so that more people uh, will listen to us in the future. Next Tuesday, 7th of April at 6 p.m., we'll be joined by Labour MP John Crudder to consider the impact of a new Labour leader on the party, on wider progressive politics and the politics of the, of the crisis. So please join us again then. Um, and until then, please, everyone, keep really safe and keep really well. Good night and we'll speak soon. Take care.